afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Taylor. I am the programming manager here at the Johnson County Public Library. And welcome to today's Authors at JCPL presentation. We are thankful for Indiana Humanities and their novel conversation speaker program for sponsoring our event today. Uh, also, a huge thank you to Wild Bees Bookshop. There's Brooke there in the back. Um, for coming out today to sell some books for us. Um, if you purchased a book today, or if you received a book from us, or if you brought one from home, uh, Mr. Moore will be signing after his presentation today, so stick around. Before we begin, if you could all please go ahead and silence your cell phones for me, please. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. Everybody's scrambling. I love it. That's wonderful. And now it is my honor to introduce our guest speaker. After decades as a professional musician, Edward Kelsey Moore published his first novel, The Supremes at Earl's All You Can Eat. This diner in Plainview, Indiana is home away from home for Odette, Clarice, and Barbara Jean. Dubbed The Supremes during high school in the 1960s, these best friends have weathered life storms for over four decades and counseled one another through marriage and children, happiness, and the blues. Recipient of a first novel award from the Black Caucus of the American Library Association, this title landed on the New York Times bestseller list. In a starred review of the sequel, The Supreme, Supreme Sing the Happy Heartache Blues, Publishers Weekly writes, Moore weaves strands together beautifully, with humor balancing out the more painful moments. His characters, both living and dead, come together to make a wonderful whole. <laughs> and now, to talk about how he does that, please join me in welcoming Edward Kelsey Moore. Thank you, Sarah, and uh, thank you, Alyssa, and uh, thank you to everyone here at the Johnson County Public Library. Uh, it's a real treat to be here, and I also should thank Indiana Humanities for making my visit possible. I, I love reading at libraries. It's, um, they feel like home to me. Uh, it, and so being here is a really a perfect venue for me. The thing is, for me, uh, I have been a library fan since the day I can, first, first day I can remember. <laughs> and uh, I mean that literally. Uh, some of you, uh, if, I've, if I've met you before, if you've heard me talk at a library by any chance before, you, you've heard the story, so I'm going to make you suffer through it again. <laughs> Most of you have maybe not heard the story, but um, you know, when I say that libraries have been an important part of my life since I can remember, I, I really mean that quite literally. The first clear memory of my entire life is in the Central Library and, and in the Indianapolis Public Library. And uh, that afternoon is, is vivid to me because I was there with my mother to get my first library card. I was five years old and I had wanted that library card so bad. And I, part, I should say, you know, I was. Part of it is that I came from a family that valued books, but didn't have a lot of money to buy books. And also, I was the very spoiled youngest child of three. <laughs> and my brother and sister both had library cards, so uh, anything that they had that I didn't have, it took on extra added importance in my life. <laughs> so, you know, when, it, when I was five years old and was able to get my first library card, it was a huge, huge deal to me. So, you know, everything was going great that day, uh, and I found out, though, there was a catch. Um, for those of you who are under a certain age, you won't remember this, but you used to have to be able to write your full name <laughs> unassisted to get your library card. Um, I didn't know about that until that day, and <laughs> apparently my mother must have forgotten, uh, because then they told me, of course, that uh, I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to write my name. I knew how to write my letters, but I had never written my name out before. And when I found out about that rule and that I wouldn't be able to get that card, I threw this fit. <laughs> this epic fit. And I, I, I fell out on the floor, I kicked and I screamed. I made this huge scene and embarrassed my poor mother. Um, I, I should say that uh, this was not unusual behavior for me. <laughs> I, 
I was a very, very dramatic little boy. And, um, you know, instead of dragging me out of there that day, my dear patient mother calmed me down and took me to the main reading room at the Central Library and taught me how to write my name. Aww. And I got my library card that afternoon, and I've had one ever since. <laughs> and, uh, and that day uh, began my lifelong relationship with books. Uh, as I've said many times, I, I wouldn't be a reader, much less a writer, if it weren't for libraries. So I'm uh, always thrilled to be invited to speak at a library. I know I'm going to have a good time. I'm going to meet fun and smart people. Uh, you know, after that day, getting that first library card, I, even on that day, I remember having this fantasy of having a book with my name on the spine on the shelf. And I just, I wanted that so much, even at that point in my life. And, you know, if I were writing this as a part of a book, then the protagonist of the book would become a writer, a very young writer, and would you know, immediately just you know, start cranking out novels. Um, <laughs> that didn't happen for me. Um, uh, what happened for me was, a few years later, I started to play the cello. And I fell in love with it, and I began a, a, a music career that has been very rewarding and, uh, and lovely in many, many ways. But I always wanted to write, even throughout that, even though I was very happy as a musician, I still wanted to write. And it took me a long, long time to get back to it. About, oh, 40 years or so. <laughs> and, uh, so, but when I did finally get up around to writing, I based my first short story on my very close relationship with my great aunt. Um, Auntie, we called her, her name was Olitha. Um, was the greatest storyteller I have ever known. She was just incredible. And she was also a, a funeral lover. And I, I, you know, every time I talk about her, I, I talk about her a lot, just because she was a, a big influence on me. And every time I mention her, the people I'm always go, mm. you know, because either they know another funeral lover or they are a funeral lover. And so it's, um, but uh, Auntie was one of those, she would travel all over Indianapolis to go to the funeral of anybody she'd ever met or, or had any connection with. She just loved it. And the only thing she loved more than a really good funeral was criticizing a bad one. <laughs> you know, she would, you know, she would criticize the flowers, she would criticize the outfit on the corpse, she would, you know, she, it, it, anything. You know? and, uh, I turned my memories of Auntie in, into my very first short story. I, I fictionalized it and exaggerated many, many things. And, uh, and wrote a story called Grandma and the Elusive Fifth Crucifix. And that was my first completed short story. Um, and that story ended up winning uh, Chicago Public Radio Stories on Stage Contest. And that began my writing career. And I, I followed up that story with uh, several more short stories and essays. And eventually, I wrote my first novel, uh, The Supremes That Are All's All You Can Eat. Um, when I wrote that novel, I returned again to my family uh, for inspiration because when I was a kid, I figured out pretty early on that the conversation happening in the room after holiday dinners when my mother and the other women in the family were cleaning up and you know, putting the food away and, and, and washing dishes, that conversation was so much more interesting than the conversation happening in the room where my dad and the other men were watching football. And I used to park myself right outside the kitchen door and listen in on those conversations. And even though I was too young to really understand what they were talking about, I was struck, even back then, by just how quickly the topics would veer from something really heartbreaking to something hilariously funny. And I was also amazed by how some of the women who had had really hard lives and difficult circumstances were also some of the funniest people in the room. 
And that was just something that really stuck with me. So when I started writing that first novel, I thought about that. I thought about the way that my mother and her sister and my great aunts would all get together and talk and just the, the rhythm of the conversation and the way that they spoke to each other. I was so struck by that and I really wanted to try to get that feeling into my books. Uh, I, because I wanted my family members to still continue speaking to me, <laughs> I, I didn't spill any family secrets in, in either of my books. Uh, but again, I, I wanted the spirit of that conversation to be in the book. And when I wrote my second novel, uh, The Supreme Sing the Happy Hearted Blues, uh, which is, uh, like, the, like I think just like everything I write, a kind of a funny book about really awful things. <laughs> and, um, in this case, uh, it uh, largely has to do with fractured relationships between fathers and their children. And it also has its very earliest roots in stories that came from uh, Aunt Olitha. You know, uh, Auntie told me a bunch of stories about uh, her husband who had deserted her and their daughter. And that happened long before I was born. But my good church-going great aunt claimed to hold no grudges against him for having abandoned her. Um, but when she talked about his failure to be a good father to her daughter, then she would shed that pious Baptist lady veneer, and then she would you know, very gleefully talk about the punishments that she prayed the Lord would meet out on him. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, um, there was some bad stuff that she hoped would happen to his <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I thought about that. I thought my, my great aunt had this deep belief in forgiveness and also those fantasies of revenge. <laughs> and, uh, and they were on my mind when I wrote uh, The Supreme Sing the Happy Heartache Blues. You know, in the world of the novel, a man leaves his family uh, to pursue this single minded obsession with music, with blues, and blues music in this case, uh, instead of just walking out merely because he's a jerk. Uh, and in addition to the desertion, uh, this man's unforgivable act is compounded by a, a tragic moment of violence. Um, as I, I, since I know that um, I'm thrilled to know that many people in this room have read uh, the Supremes at Earl's All You Can Eat, and some of you I know have also read the Supremes saying the Happy Heartache Blues. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> So, um, so I thought actually what I would do today um, is not read from either of them. Um, instead, I think I, I would like to read a, a, a shortened version of that first short story, uh, Grandma and the Elusive Fifth, Fifth Crucifix. You know, I'll tell you something. If I had something to do again, I would not have given it that title. That is so hard to say. Grandma and the Elusive Fifth Crucifix. That's really, you know, that is a, that is a first time writer's mistake. <laughs> so then I wrote a book called The Supreme Center is All You Can Eat. You know, it's like, <laughs> I never learned. <laughs> so this, uh, this story, again, is uh, something that's in, that was inspired I think of all the things I've written, it was certainly the most directly inspired uh, by the greatest storyteller I've ever known, my, my great Aunt Aletha. And this is Grandma and the Elusive Fifth Crucifix. Grandma Goldine took sick 15 years ago. We found out when she stood up from her chair and made the announcement just before she gave the Thanksgiving dinner blessing. Due to illness, she said, <coughs> She had quit her job of five decades as the church secretary at the First Baptist Church of Plainview, Indiana. From that day forward, she intended to leave her home only for reasons of dire necessity. The family interpreted the dire necessities of Grandma's life to be church services, her Saturday night card games, and funerals. We were almost right. Grandma informed us that having led an exemplary life thus far and having no plans to change, she, no, she saw no reason to risk her fragile health by dragging herself to church each Sunday. <laughs> Grandma refused to offer any details about her infirmity, and she insisted that no one discuss her condition with anyone outside the family. She instructed all of her grandchildren to 
just tell them Grandma has taken sick. <laughs> True to her word, for the rest of her life, my grandmother only left her home to enjoy a rousing game of bid whist with her friends or to celebrate death like a good Baptist widow. <laughs> of the black churches in Plainview, First Baptist had the largest congregation. According to my grandmother, that was because First Baptist provided the best funeral services in the state. <laughs> Plainview Lutheran didn't come close. <laughs> Grandma always returned from Lutheran funerals, making dis disapproving clucking sounds and shaking her head over the lack of emotional fireworks. <laughs> Those Lutherans sure kick the F.U. in right out of funeral, she would say. <laughs> After she took sick, Grandma stuck exclusively to First Baptist, where appropriate quality assurance, quality assurance measures were in place. For the rest of her life, my grandmother had documented evidence that, sorry, by the last year of her life, my grandmother had documented evidence that she had attended every memorial service held at First Baptist over 75 years. <laughs> I was a 16-year-old boy when Grandma retired from the world. As a self-taught teenage psychologist, I diagnosed my grandmother as suffering from various mental disorders, including agoraphobia and hypochondria. <laughs> Having deemed her a worthy case for close observation, and being a teenager with a keen desire to use his newly minted driver's license, I offered to be Grandma's chauffeur. For two years, I went everywhere my grandmother went. I shuttled her to and from church whenever a congregant died, and I made sure that she got to her Saturday night bidwist game. My grandmother's bidwist partners were, like her, Negro widows in their 70s who claimed to be Negro widows in their 60s. <laughs> All four women had spent their entire lives in Plainview with the exception of Miss Hattie. She had migrated to Indiana in her early 20s from an even, even smaller town across the border in Kentucky. And after 50 years, she still found Plainview's pace exhaustingly hectic. <laughs> Miss Hattie couldn't have weighed more than 90 pounds, and she was less than five feet tall. But her diminutive stature belied tremendous strength developed during decades of farm work my earliest childhood memories of her are recollections of trying desperately to wriggle free from her anaconda hugs. <laughs> Miss Hattie only styled her hair on Sunday mornings. The rest of the week, she lashed down stray tufts with grotesquely lifelike plastic bumblebee barrettes. <laughs> By the time the Saturday night card game came around, Miss Hattie looked eerily like she had been attacked by an angry swarm of bees. <laughs> the most accomplished card player, Miss Anna, was a heavyset woman who smiled constantly. Her enormous jowls quivered when she laughed, and for some time afterwards, due to her excessive fleshiness and the laws of physics. <laughs> she also had a pocketbook full of the worst tasting hard candies in the world. <laughs> Horrid confections that were flavored with sulfur and molasses. <laughs> Unfortunately, Miss Anna was as generous as she was good natured. <laughs> While the other Bidwist partners could plead restricted diets or denture problems, I had to politely accept her exotic sweets with a strained smile. The final member of Grandma's quartet, Miss Carmel, was a tall, slender woman who saw herself as the most refined creature in Plainview. According to my grandmother, Miss Carmel had seen a Katherine Hepburn movie in 1940, and after that day, began speaking through clenched teeth in what was supposed to be a Connecticut Yankee accent. <laughs> this affectation, mixed with her natural Southern Indiana twang, produced a manner of speech that was both unique and virtually unintelligible. <laughs> in spite of her pretenses, Miss Carmel was charming and kind. She also baked oatmeal cookies that were so delicious 
that they wiped away the taste, if not the memory, of Miss Anna's awful hard candies. My grandmother's love for her evenings of cards and gossip with her dearest friends was surpassed by her, excuse me, surpassed only by her abiding affection for a good funeral service. In our family, death rites were more important than births and often more festive than funerals. Folks in Plainview used to say, those Max Berries sure know how to die. <laughs> they didn't say that just because of the high quality of the memorial services we threw. Our family achieved considerable local celebrity by dying prematurely under tragic and usually avoidable circumstances. <laughs> My late great aunt Mary swore up and down that regardless of what the bottles warned, her bathtub only sparkled when she mixed a little ammonia with her Clorox. <laughs> My cousin Arla awoke on her last morning and vowed that by the end of that day, she would find out for sure what an electrical outlet tasted like. <laughs> Grandma supervised all of the family memorials. Given, as chance would have it, an extraordinary amount of practice and a natural affinity for the task, she became a true connoisseur of funeral planning. One of Grandma's innovations at First Baptist was a simulated gold embossed funeral service program that contained <coughs> photographs of the departed along with tributes from family members and friends. My grandmother kept scrapbooks full of those funeral programs the way that some people kept athletic ribbons or movie star photographs. When we were alone, she loved to open her scrapbooks and share her memories of the most remarkable services with me. Her, her recollections, <clears throat> excuse me, her recollections were aided by the fact that she wrote her own critical reviews on the back of each program. <laughs> Things like, poor Sister Merriweather was buried today in a cheap white dress. <laughs> even though Labor Day was a full three months ago. <laughs> she'd have been furious if she'd lived to see it. <laughs> On the back of another program she wrote, In life, Brother Collins was the best looking man in Plainview. He was almost seven feet tall and so black he looked purple. His wife, Lavelle, is a sweet woman, but she has some foolish notions about that light skin, dark skin thing. She made the undertaker plaster pale makeup on her husband that lightened him up until he was unrecognizable. <laughs> the red silk jacket was a mistake, too. <laughs> if I had been a stranger off the street, I would have sworn that I had wandered into the only Negro church in America that buried giant Chinese prostitutes. <laughs> to gain grandma's stamp of approval, tears were only the beginning. The truly bereaved had to perform. For women, that meant screaming the loved one's name repeatedly, fainting, or going into convulsions. Men could get away with subtler grieving, like low, constant moaning, or a mild coronary. <laughs> At the end of every review, grandma took into account the eulogy, attendance, floral display, and intensity of familial misery. Then she gave each funeral a quality rating. <laughs> Services were granted from one to five crucifixes. Poor attendance and a lack of wailing might mean that Grandma drew, drew only one cruci crucifix from the back of the program. <laughs> Paramedics had to be summoned to tend to bereaved relatives for the event to merit five. <laughs> During my university years and later, time spent in a series of jobs in a succession of big cities, I kept in touch with Grandma by phone. Each week, she read to me her latest reviews and kept me apprised of Plainview's news, lamenting what she saw as the declining quality of modern memorial rites and detailing the foolishness of our family members. Still, Grandma thrived through her 80s and into her 90s. 
She remained mostly housebound, but the mystery sickness that she had announced 15 years earlier had been all but forgotten. Her ailment, whatever it was, left her undiminished until the very end. I was in my apartment nursing a nasty head cold on the afternoon that my grandmother called to tell me of the passing of a distant cousin. In keeping with family tradition, our relative had died from injuries sustained when her oily rag collection spontaneously combusted. <laughs> Grandma casually mentioned that she had not given our cousin's send-off a rating on her crucifix scale. She said that she hadn't felt up to attending, and Grandma had decided not to sully her journalistic record with second-hand information. After maintaining a spotless attendance record for 75 years, my grandmother had missed a family funeral at First Baptist Church. Some things are better indicators of imminent mortality than any EKG. That night I boarded a plane bound for Indiana knowing that the end was near for Grandma. When I arrived in Plainview, my mother, the Bidwist ladies, and several relatives had already gathered at Grandma's house. I was saddened but not surprised when Mom told me that Grandma had taken a sudden turn for the worse and was not expected to live through the day. I found my grandmother lying in her four-poster bed, surrounded by her scrapbooks. She appeared to be sleeping when I tiptoed into the room, but when I crept near, she opened her eyes. She smiled and whispered to me, Brian, she said, I'm so glad you're here. There's something I've got to tell you. I held my breath. This is it, I thought. This is that life-changing, last shared moment people talk, <laughs> write, and consult therapists about. <laughs> that moment when a dying loved one imparts wisdom gleaned from having one foot already on the other side, or reveals a shocking, long-held family secret. What my grandmother said to me was, Brian, there are two things you must know. First, never walk and smoke a cigarette at the same time. <laughs> Second, never ever wear feathers to a wedding. <laughs> Those turned out to be her last words. <laughs> Life advice from a 1930s etiquette book for girls. I felt cheated. <laughs> I had lived most of my life fearing that some facet of my genetic makeup would one day force me to inspect the level of my car's gas tank with a lighted match. <laughs> I had wanted my grandmother's last words to relieve me of that worry. Although I loved my family dearly, I had secretly hoped that my grandmother would confirm the truth of my childhood fantasy that I was not a Max Berry after all, <laughs> but instead a foundling taken in and cared for by my peculiar relatives. No, much to my disappointment, it appeared that I was not the secret love child of Malcolm X and Gloria Vanderbilt. <laughs> Her funeral was four days later at First Baptist. My mother followed the copious instructions Grandma had left her for her to bring about a service that was spectacular in every detail. The best singer from the church choir sang a long, dirge-like hymn about how dreadful life is and how good Christians must suffer through terrible hardships until we are rewarded with death. <laughs> the handsome and charismatic pastor of First Baptist spoke at great length of my grandmother's piety, generosity, and courage in the face of her long illness. My grandmother's su surviving elderly friends were there, as were several generations of Max Berries from around the country. Together, we formed the largest audience ever seen at a Plainview funeral service. The afternoon sun poured through the stained glass windows of the church onto an amazing array of colorful flowers that I could not smell because of my lingering head cold, creating a tableau of serene yet dazzling beauty. Everything was perfect, but something I couldn't quite identify bothered me. 
The service was nearly over when I realized what was wrong. Unlike many of our ill-fated Max Berry kin, my grandmother had lived a long and happy life and died at a ripe old age. Until her last days, her only complaint had been a mystifying disorder that seemed only to improve her quality of life. <laughs> she passed peacefully in her own bed after delivering truly lame last words <laughs> to a grandson who adored her. It had been the kind of death people prayed for, the sort of gentle passing that makes even the deceased's closest friends smile wistfully through their sorrow. Grandma had lived too long for her demise to be greeted with racking heaves and much gnashing of teeth from her mourners. Her death was more triumph than tragedy, not a heartbreaker, just a bummer. My grandmother would not have been pleased by the tasteful and subdued goodbye she was receiving. <laughs> she had lived as a wildly enthusiastic Baptist and was going out like a bloodless Lutheran. <laughs> forth in me an unexpected and unstoppable flood of emotion. I felt my face quivering and knew that I would soon hear myself crying. I didn't, though. Instead, to my horror, my brain sent a mixed-up message to my body that caused the sudden onset of great sorrow to manifest itself with a burst of hysterical laughter. <laughs> Sandwiched between Miss Anna and Miss Carmel in the front row of the First Baptist Church of Plainview, I clamped my hand over my, over my mouth to stop myself from giggling at death's cruel irony. <laughs> Miss Anna mistook my muffled giggles for a symptom of my lingering cold. She rooted around for a while in her purse and then handed me what turned out to be the worst tasting lozenge ever manufactured. The shocking flavor helped though. My laughing spell had ended when our row was summoned to the altar for our final goodbyes moments later. I was a few feet from the casket when I caught sight of a swarm of bees headed for my chest and felt a searing pain. After a moment of confusion, I realized that it was Miss Hattie's barrette-covered head that I had seen speeding toward me, and that, still remarkably powerful for her size, she had squeezed the breath out of me with one of her crushing embraces. I twisted and turned until Miss Hattie finally released me from her grasp. But when I was free, I still couldn't breathe. The coal, tar, and horse urine flavored lozenge <laughs> that Miss Anna had given me to halt the laughter she had mistaken for coughing was now lodged in my windpipe. Oh, no. My attempts at inhalation brought only the slightest whiffs of air into my burning lungs. My eyes began to water as I gestured wildly toward my throat. Miss Hattie responded by hugging me again, while Miss Anna gently consoled me with, I know, son, I know, just let it out. <laughs> the sight of the two elderly ladies apparently comforting me as I wept must have been quite moving, because I began to hear sobs rising from a congregation that had previously been sitting in reverent silence. As my vision began to blur from lack of oxygen, I saw that all around me, Ladies were reaching into their pocketbooks for handkerchiefs. Men were loudly clearing their throats and swiping at their cheeks with the backs of their hands. Still, no one seemed to notice that I was choking to death. <laughs> I panicked. I broke away from Grandma's friends and ran toward the coffin. At a full run, I forced myself diaphragm first against the casket in an effort to perform a modified Heimlich. <laughs> More wails erupted from the crowd as they beheld my display of deranged grief. My actions dislodged several blooms from the wreath on the casket, but just barely moved the obstruction in my throat. By the time the pallbearers moved in to restrain me, the church was in an uproar of mourning. I heard my mother cry out, Oh, how that boy loved his grandma. <laughs> I awoke in the back.
back of an ambulance parked <laughs> in the church lot. A paramedic was smiling down at me as she held the remainder of the offending lozenge in her gloved hand for me to see. Doc, Doc Phillips mentholated drops. You don't see these much anymore. <laughs> she announced it as if I should be proud. <laughs> the internment went on without me after I assured my family that I would be fine. One of my cousins offered to drive me to my parents' home, but I declined. Instead, I climbed into my rental car and headed for grandma's. Once there, I let myself into my grandmother's silent house using the key I'd had for decades. I went straight to her bedroom and lay down on her bed. Then I pulled her gold embossed funeral program from the breast pocket of my suit jacket. With a pen that I found on grandma's nightstand, I wrote on the back of the program, Goldine Maxberry was buried in an elegant navy blue dress. She had sadder music, a bigger crowd, and more flowers than anyone in Plainview had ever seen. Her grandson, Brian, really performed. <laughs> Before tucking it into the last page of Grandma's most recent scrapbook, I objectively considered the quality of the service, and at the bottom of the program drew five crucifixes. After all, there were paramedics. <laughs> Uh, that was my first short story. That was my, my, first, uh, my first published short story and my first completed short story. <laughs> and uh, that really was uh, the, the story that began my writing career. I got, um, I, like, as I said, I, I was one of the winners of the Chicago Public Radio Stories on Stage contest with that story. Um, it was later published in a literary magazine and it got some attention from various people, and including an agent in New York who suggested that I write a short story collection. Um, and I told him that I'd be happy to send him my short story collection. I didn't mention that I had one short story. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote some more, and, um, and I eventually did send him um, a, a short story collection, which of course he rejected. <laughs> but uh, the, I guess about, Nine or ten of those stories have been published in different magazines over the years, and but, but the short story itself, the short story collection itself, was never published as a group. And uh, then I, that same agent said, "Oh, you should write a novel. Nobody wants to read short stories by an unknown writer." So I thought, "Okay, I'll write a novel." And I wrote the first novel, and then he rejected that. <laughs> and then there's a long story that goes after that. <laughs> anyway, but uh, so I thought, um, if you have time, I'd love to answer some questions if you have any. <coughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, if I recall correctly, your father was minister. Yes. Okay. When Odette was in the hospital, were any of her reflections and connections that she made, were any of those related to any stories that were related to your father by seriously ill or dying members of the congregation? No, actually. Um, that's, that's a short answer, no. <laughs> all, of, all of that uh, came just from, from my imagination, from what I thought uh, with these characters um, as the book, you know, gets towards the end, and you're thinking about just who who these people are, and what's the especially the last image that I want for the reader to have of these people. That was where that came from. It really wasn't mm -hmm. from my dad. Um, excuse me. Get some water. I I'll tell you. I, I didn't intentionally fashion any characters off of any real life people. I later, um, it was actually when I was on book tour with the first novel and I was reading sections of the first novel and talking with people about it, that was when I realized that Big Girl from the first novel is my father. I had not had any intention of trying to portray my father in that character, but 
absolutely everything that comes out of Big Girl's mouth in that novel could have come out of my father's. It was not, you know, it just not, it was, I, I was really not trying to do it, and I was surprised to discover that I had. But it was, uh, it was a lovely surprise, you know, but still I was not expecting that. Yes? Tell, tell us about your cello travel yeah. career. <laughs> Well, um, I'm still a cellist. I still perform uh, with uh, a couple of orchestras in Chicago. Uh, the Chicago Sinfonietta is the main one I play with, and then I play for the Joffrey Ballet Orchestra and, um, and a few other things that people ask me to do. But um, now I don't play nearly as much as I used to because I don't have the time. But, and, I don't, and I no longer teach. I taught for many, many years. And um, I but loved teaching. I, I miss it a lot. You came through... Um IU. I did. I went to IU. And, I went to the, then, uh, music school in Indiana. Uh, and I went to graduate school at the State University of New York. And, mm. um, and I've uh, been fortunate to be able to, to work as a cellist. And uh, I, you know, I've, I've been extremely fortunate in my life and to be able to do two things that I absolutely love and, and to be able to make a living at them, um, especially in music, which is, you know, just, it's astounding if you can eat and be you know, <laughs> a musician. I've, so I've, I've been very, very lucky, and I've had a great time. I really missed playing. I had to not really stop, but I had to really slow down playing. Once the, my literary career started moving along, and I realized that I just wouldn't have time to perform as much as I used to, and I really missed it. I missed being with my colleagues and uh, and just playing music. You know, it's being a musician is uh, it's a wonderful thing to do. You know, it's it's you when you begin when you have that fantasy that you can be a musician when you're for most of it it starts when you're children and it's it's like this wonderful game that gets to go on until you die, you know? It's just, and that's the thing, you know, you really, if you're fortunate, you get to do it in your entire life. And uh, it's, and every time I'm, when I'm not playing, I miss it. And uh, when I am playing, I'm sick of it. <laughs> but, uh, but, not, but that doesn't happen much anymore. I, I'm thrilled every time I get to do it. Because now, I'll tell you, after having to step back from it, I appreciate it much more. And I, even situations sometimes that used to be a little more stressful, a little more annoying to me, are now I appreciate them. And now I calm myself down and say, you know what, I'm lucky to be here. And just, and I try to enjoy it. And I'm so far, it's working. Yes? Now that you have us hooked on these characters, <laughs> will there be more Supreme novels in the future? I think I will write at least one more, but the book I'm working on right now is a new set of characters. Oh. But I, I do have some ideas for where I want these characters to be several years down the line. I, I know who I want them to be as old ladies, and, um, and I, I will write that book one day. Um, I've, I've, every now and then I make little notes about it, but the, the next book uh, will be a new group of people. It's, well, my book club has already cast the big spectacular. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, have you had any well, the, authors or the, any? The film rights were, uh, were actually optioned several years ago. Okay. Um, actually, before the book came out, the, oh. uh, the, book, the film rights were optioned. And um, I, I hope there'll be more news about that very soon. I'll probably be there. Okay. So, but things, things look good. <laughs> but again, you know, but the, the truth is, as, as the writer of the novel, I will be the last person to know. <laughs> so, uh, but, but that's okay. It's, yes? How do you go about uh, writing? Do you write daily, or do you write when you feel like writing, or...? Um... Well, right now, I'm trying to write every day. The truth is, in order... In order to get anything done, you have to write every day. That's well, at least, let me rephrase that. I have to write every day. Some people can maybe write when they feel like it, but for me that would mean uh, every month or so. <laughs> um, because it's, it's hard. And, you know, uh, it's, 
and it's not always fun. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a good thing to avoid. And but although I I should say I, I do I do enjoy it once I'm actually doing it, and it's fun to make up stories and write them down. And then but the, that first draft, <laughs> I find that just so unpleasant. I just getting that first draft out. After that, I really love it. I love revising. I I. Because you get immediate gratification, you know, it's, it's better an hour later. When you're writing the first draft, you know it's terrible, and you know it's going to be <laughs> terrible for months ahead. And, and you have to allow yourself to go on, even after you've written something terrible. You have to say, okay, I, I can't think this now. I have to go to the next chapter, and then trust that I can come back and make it good later. That's very difficult for me to do. I think it's difficult for everyone. Otherwise, more people would write the books they say they won't write. Right. Oh, right. But um, for me, in order to really get it done, what I have to do is set a minimum word output per day and stick to it. And put my behind in the chair and not leave until I have those words out. And I have to do that day after day after day. Ultimately, I'm, when I'm being realistic about it, I'm satisfied with five days a week. I know some people do six or seven. I don't think that's, that doesn't work for me. I need, a, I need a day or two off. But in order to finish, the, you know, right now I'm trying to get through the first draft of my new book. And I'm gonna have to put all of my weird, uh, obsessive compulsive energy into, uh, into sitting down every single day and just cranking it out. That's the only way I know how to do it. I, if there's another way, I'd be thrilled to know. <laughs> yes? Um, I love it. I hope this is a spoiler but um, in your book, um, the first, the screams that Rose All You Can Eat, the, the ghost characters, mm -hmm. and, and Eleanor Roosevelt. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I just wonder, did you hear ghost stories when you were younger, or how did that come to play in these, especially, I mean, only not, you know, only, what the dad saw and like her mother. I mean, so did you have family members that had a gift of sight or something? That I had, you know, I, I had one family member who claimed that she was always talking with spirits of different sorts, but um, but other than that, not really. Um, they I, were just great. <laughs> the, the ghost actually, it's when I uh, when I wrote the first novel, originally uh, Odette's mother was alive. She wasn't a ghost until I was maybe a third of the way through the book, and I thought, oh, you know what? I think I'll kill her. <laughs> that wasn't exactly how that happened. I, I thought, I thought that maybe it, it just it just seemed right. It seemed that she was having a talk with her mother that was not that was would be better served by her mother being gone, and. Then when, when I made that decision, other things sort of uh, fell into line after that. And I, the whole idea with the ghost was that when I started seeing this friendship of these three women as its own separate character, you know, there's the, the, the women as individuals, and then there's also the friendship, which has its own life and, and is maintained by each of these three women. And then I began to see it as its, its own sort of world beyond, beyond the world. It's, yes, beyond their, their relationships with their husbands, with their, with their children. They have this separate thing, this friendship. And I started to think about how friendships that last over the course of decades are so unique. And you know, you may have a very wonderful and intense and gratifying relationship with someone you've known for a few years, but it's different from the relationship you have with someone who's known you for 40. And in those relationships, when you are with that friend who you've known for decades, that moment that you're together, that this lunch you're having today, is every bit as much about today, or, or every bit as much about a lunch you had together in 1984 as it is the lunch you're having today. And that whole notion that the past 
is very much present in every interaction that we have with an old friend was what made the ghost make sense for me. That the past is always there and it is in, it's interacting with us whether we want it to or not. And that was where that came from. But Eleanor Roosevelt? <laughs> there, well, there are two, there, well, there are a few reasons for that. Uh, first, I really like Eleanor Roosevelt. I, um, I, I think Eleanor Roosevelt is really one of the great Americans of the, of the last century. So uh, I think any book is better for having a little Eleanor Roosevelt. <laughs> So, um, so I thought I'm going to put her in mine. <laughs> so there's that, and then also uh, th that was th that's part of it. But then also, I wanted in a book about friendship, I wanted Dora to have a friend, and so I knew from early on that the friend would not have very much dialogue. I think the character speaks two lines of dialogue in the entire book, and I wanted this friend to, I wanted people to be able to picture her and to have some sort of image of who the friend was. And then I wanted to turn that image upside down with her behavior. So uh, that was why I remember Roosevelt. I, because I like her and because I want to do her that friend. <laughs> yes? You do such a good job. I've read both your novels and you do such a good job writing from a woman's perspective. Thank do you. you draw on that from females in your life? I, I don't understand how men can... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, I'll tell you, part of that is, I was surprised when people started telling me that. You know, I'm, I'm thrilled that when people, people have been very kind about that and, and, and mentioned that to me. Um, but, but mostly I just think if you write characters who are very much themselves, and then you get out of the way, then and don't start putting your your thoughts in their mouths. If you just do that, I think mostly it works. Mm -hmm. I think the thing is that most male writers uh, don't do that, and very often will have so they'll produce female characters who are judging themselves in the way that men often judge women, or are, are the right characters in a way that is patronizing, or uh, that's got a sort of a dismissive quality. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I think, again, if, if you get out of the character's way, then you, you wouldn't do that. Most of the men, like, there's some very fine writers, male writers I know, who have written books uh, from a woman's point of view that are terrible, and that are, uh, that I, I think if I were a woman, I would read this book and I would find it insulting, some of them. And I, because there's a way that men often write about women that is insulting. And I wanted, uh, I wanted these women to be real people and to feel like they would actually do and say the things that they're doing and saying. I felt it. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I really do. Thank you. Oh, but just one other little thing. I should say, I, you know, I wrote this book uh, as a... Uh, as a 50-year-old, it's a very different thing. If I, if I were writing it as a 30-year-old, I might not have been able to do that. Um, because, but, but once you get to be 50, if you haven't settled your issues with your own masculinity, and your own, then you're never going to, and you've got a lot of problems. So, but you know, as a 50-year-old man, I, you know, I hope uh, that, you know, that some of those things have been put to rest. And so I'm, not, so I'm not worried about those sorts of things. Yes? But it seems like you approach each of your characters with great affection. Mm -hmm. I like them. <laughs> I, you know, um, that was the, I'll tell you, when you write a book, you don't know if anybody else will ever read it. You don't know if you will be revising that thing for the next 25 years. So I, I thought, you know, I wonder if I'm dealing with these people forever, and I'm, and I'm dealing with them, I, as it turns out, I am dealing with them forever, because people, like you, have been so kind to actually read it. So, and so I've been talking about them a lot. So I, you know, I don't want to talk about awful people and, and uh, forever, you know, and deal with, they're certainly, uh, in both of my books, they're characters who are not so nice and do, do some awful things. But uh, I realized, although 
I read a lot of books that are quite grim, and I, and I love a good juicy mystery with you know lots of death and horrible things in it. But and I thought that I, actually when I first started writing, I thought I would write a mystery because I really think they're fun. I realized pretty early on that I'm not a mystery writer, partly because I'm not a plot guy. I'm a character guy, yeah. and also I did not want every day to think about murder and, and people yeah. hurting each other. Mm -hmm. I thought, you know, I, I, that's just not what I want in my head every day. And so I wrote characters that I liked because I wanted to spend my time with them. And that was, that was a very selfish decision that I think has paid off, frankly. I think uh, I'm a much happier person than I would be if I, if I were instead you know, standing up here and describing stab wounds, you know. <laughs> I, it's just, you know, that's, that's just for my own sanity. I wanted to write people who I could get along with. Anyone else? Yes. Why did you choose for the three women, um, their friend, <clears throat> calling them the Supremes? Were you a fan of? Oh, I love this room. <laughs> I, I was supposed to marry Diana Ross. <laughs> <laughs> when I, I had this all planned when I was 10. You know, we, were, <laughs> we were gonna get married, and I was gonna get so it didn't she, work out. Does she know that? You know, she doesn't know. <laughs> 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 um, Do you know if she's read your book? I, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I have, um, but you know, I hope that she does, and I hope she's happy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Who are some of your favorite writers? Oh, gosh. You have a That's a long time. list. Um, um, well, I think probably Dickens is my favorite writer. Wow. I, I love Dickens. Um, and uh, of more contemporary people, I love, um, I love Ann Patchett. I love um, Julia Glass, uh, John Irving. Uh, I like storytellers. I like people who can tell a good story and keep me involved. But like I said, I also really love some grim stuff. I, I really love Stephen King. I, I really love to, I think, I think he's a great writer. And I, and, but again, you know, plot. These are, you know, there's, that's, there's a great plot writer, and I wish I could do that. I wish I could just, you know, but that's, I, I accept that that's not who I am. And I, you know, I'm, I'm much more interested in who the people are than what they're doing. <laughs> and um, I hope I can give them something interesting to do, but, um, but it's, for me, it's really about who, who are these people. One more. One more question, anybody? Yes? So the, the story that you, the first story that you submitted to anything or anyone was mm -hmm. the This American Life format? It was, um, there was a, a, a show on uh, public radio that was a, just a series of short stories, short story readings, um, and that was the, the show. And I, they had a yearly contest and I had decided, I'll tell you this is, I'll make this story as brief as possible, but there's a, it's, which is, in case you haven't noticed, it's hard for me. <laughs> I, uh, there was, uh, so there's this contest, and when I turned 40, I decided that I had to finally finish something I was writing. I used to write things and never finish them, and for decades. And so I finally, decided, okay, I gotta stop that, I need to finish something. And I started writing this story, excuse me, about um, writing this fictionalized version of the story about my great aunt and the funerals. What I didn't mention actually with my great aunt and the funerals is that when I was a very little boy, she lived next door to us and she would take me with her to the funeral. <laughs> so, anyway, so I started writing this story about, uh, about this old lady and her grandson and the funerals. And, and my idea was uh, that I, this goal was to send it off to that short story contest. And I think their deadline was in June of that year. And so I, I was like, okay, I'm going to finish the story. I'm going to finish the story. And I, I sat down, I wrote it, and it was going pretty well. And then I got distracted, and I didn't finish it. And I was feeling, you know, I was like, ah, darn it. But, I, but you know, I put it away, and I was like, oh, I'll come back to it later. Well, what happened was, about three months later, I got hired to play the cello at this gig. And uh, if you were a 
gigging musician, uh, what you what happens is somebody calls you up, tells you uh, for for most things. Not this is not for orchestra concerts, but for just your you know a weekend gig. Somebody will call you up and say, uh, "Be at such and such a place at such and such a time. Wear a tux." And you show up and you bring your instrument and you got a tuxedo and you sit down and they hand you music and you play. Oh my goodness. So that's, and that's, that's just the job. That's what, what we do you know, most of the year. So um, I went to this job and when I got there I discovered that it was a party for the people who won the short story contest. <laughs> that I didn't enter because I got lazy. So I sat there for three hours and played Mozart quartets oh. with, this, with these people just thinking, oh. and it, was, you know, it really was not that I was sitting there thinking, oh, I would have won, I would have won. It was just that I didn't finish it again, oh, you know, yeah. after years and years and years of not finishing things that I'd fallen back into that same habit of not doing it. And so, I was, so that night I just said, okay, I got to I got to change this. Well, I gave myself time. I waited for the next year for it to <laughs> like, contest to roll around again. But when that did, I got that story out of the thing, you know, out of the bin. I uh, finished it and sent it in, and uh, and ended up winning. And you know, I, I've said this many times, and I swear this is the truth. I've had some really really lovely experiences uh, since the novels have come out. And I've been able to travel, and I've, been, I've met a lot of wonderful people, and I've just had this, uh, this incredible adventure. But honestly, the best moment of my writing career to this day is the walk from my house to the mailbox with that first completed story. Mm -hmm. I will never forget that feeling. It was incredible. And I knew at that moment that I had changed something in my life, that something very significant had happened. And with all the other, the other things have been lovely, but that moment, just, just walking down that street with the, you know, decades of not finishing and going, yeah, I really can finish something. I can, I can you know, make a decision and stick to it. It really was a huge turning point in my life. And I will never forget that. I remember every single step of that walk from, you know, it's, it's a half a block away from my house. That we all I, I, I honestly remember, I remember the smell. It's, I remember, I was, it was just this, it was this wonderful, uh, just this wonderful high, and I'll, I'll never forget that. So, anyway, well, thank you all so much.